Welcome to our session here today. I uh, hope you're enjoying the summit. I'm Ron Bodkin. I'm the founder of Think Big Analytics. We're a professional services company that provides analytics solutions on top of big data technologies, notably Hadoop. And we're excited to be here today sharing some experiences from our work together with NetApp, where we've built a advanced analytics application for device support data on their own interesting application environment, uh, for their own applications, that is. Um, I'm speaking here today with Scott Fleming, who's an architect with ThinkBig Analytics, and Kumar, who's an enterprise architect and a real visionary for the use of Hadoop inside of NetApp. And we're excited to be presenting here today. All right. Thanks, Ron. So welcome, everyone. My name is Kumar Palniyappan. I'm an enterprise architect at NetApp. So we are very happy to be partnering with ThinkBig Analytics uh, doing this Hadoop implementation within our enterprise. So we, we're going to talk about what the big data challenges we have and then the solution architect, architecture which uh, Scott will be going over. So those of you not, uh, might not be, uh, those who are not familiar with what is NetApp is, we are one of the Fortune 500 companies and then so we are 11,000 plus employees and then uh, we got 5 billion plus revenue growth and then what we do, what we used to, what, what we do is we store, protect, and then retrieve and serve the data to you and now and then. So that's what our core competitive. And one of the thing is, which is very key, what we are going to talk about is global support, which is one of the key differentiator in our global support is kind of an auto support, uh, which is proactive supporting model. Our business challenge is, uh, with our market success and product innovations, have driven our product and support analytics. Uh, we cannot stand with the traditional business intelligence systems and all. So we really kind of looked out what is the kind of a infrastructure and the data processing available in order to kind of process the data and make the data available for the massive amount of data which we get from our install base. So auto support is our kind of auto support is basically what it is is uh, so at our install base at the site so we it's a call home industry standard functionality it's a machine generator device log data which will be automatically uploaded back to our systems and also it it it, it, it gets generated every day and then we get that data as an event and then kind of a log files weekly and then daily basis. How we support that in our environment is kind of more of a self-healing and then automated uh, embedded supportability in our devices. So that sense automatically whenever the event happens or when there is kind of a something goes wrong with our systems, it sends those events and then we just kind of capture and then it just helps us to kind of a give a proactive support model to the customers. So by saying that, what's our data volume is? It's our data volume is 600,000 events per week, and then we kind of use three terabytes of uh, disk space per week, and then it grows 40% year over year. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a faster disk growth, and then we, we've been expanding our products and features, so we we will be getting more and more massive data. So how we are going to really kind of support this going forward and all. So, so we looked at it and then we come up with a kind of a, <laughs> okay, so this is uh, how the additional infrastructure and the kind of a processing need to be implemented. That's where we kind of partnered with ThinkBig Analytics to just kind of implement the Hadoop solution. So Ron will be going over the rest of the things. Thank you, Kumar. So indeed, um, with all the data coming in from NetApp's devices in the field, there was a tremendous scaling challenge. How could their ingestion and processing infrastructure keep up? But even more, there was a crisis of enterprise amnesia. How can NetApp do more with the data? 
Today, what they've been able to do with their, their more traditional architecture of relational database and search engine is, is look at specific records at great cost and, and effort to, to identify a case or to resolve things. And what they want to do is to be able to do more advanced analytics on top of their data. They want to be able to do things like improve the service they offer customers by predicting when things are going to fail before they fail, building, data model, building models to allow for that. They want to be able to sell better to customers, to understand what customers aren't using to help them get better use out of their products, and they want to do product planning. They want to do analysis to better understand what kind of features customers are needing, what are things that would be helpful. So in any time when we look at what are applications of analytics, we like to look at at least two dimensions. One is how much data do you need to process, and the other is what's the latency of data access. As we'll see later, those characteristics become important when you think about what technologies are good for implementing the solution. So here, it's no surprise that the kind of functionality that had been lacking was typically slower, late, higher latency but high volume access, the ability to generate reports and build predictive models at a much larger time frame with high value. And indeed, you know, we see there's a tremendous value in scaling up this infrastructure, as we'll talk about in the solution architecture, but there's also tremendous value in building more advanced analytics, being able to build predictive models, so that being able to take indicators like increased uh, or degraded performance and increased frequency of warnings and errors to predict pending failures on the service side, and also being able to predict, build predictive models of things like cross-selling and upselling. This customer is running low on capacity. This customer is showing this pattern that indicates they would benefit from this additional feature. So building these kinds of models on top of this large unstructured data set is indeed a powerful capability and something that uh, NetApp is looking forward to beyond simply scaling their infrastructure to a new level. So in the rest of the talk, we're going to segue into talking more about how we built this solution together. What we've done so far, we've built a proof of concept that's functional with all of these different elements we'll talk about, and we're now engaged on a full-scale production implementation of this architecture. We'll talk mostly about what we did in the proof of concept, but we'll address some points for the future about how the system is going to be built as it goes into production. So one of the most basic questions, a question that um, sometimes goes without saying here at this conference, is, well, why use the Hadoop stack? Why build an open source-based implementation? Why use these technologies at all? And indeed, you know, this process, in, in deciding on going with this route, NetApp did its diligence and looked at a range of technologies and ended up settling on an approach of using a range of Hadoop-based open source technologies beyond Hadoop the HDFS and MapReduce. There's a number of ecosystem technologies that we'll talk about here, Hive, HBase, um, Flume, that are part of the solution stack. Um, but it's also, like many of the solutions we see out in the field, it's a hybrid in that we're going to continue to use relational database for smaller scale complex queries. So this is an architecture that blends relational with the power of Hadoop to produce a best outcome. So why Hadoop? Well, first and foremost is the total cost of ownership. This data set is scaling to hundreds of terabytes and into petabytes in the next few years. And, it's, and the cost of trying to implement this on a pure relational, more traditional architecture would be prohibitive. Moreover, there's been significant challenges in the, the more relational approach of having to break out data elements for any, time of, any type of analysis. So the agility of being able to work effectively with unstructured data is another key benefit of this architecture that Hadoop, of Hadoop. And the, the ability to have flexible processing to be able to do more advanced analytics is another really attractive feature. Beyond just having data at rest, being able to make use of these large volumes of data to improve the business. It's also important that these ecosystem technologies we're going to talk about here enabled lower latency response to events and ingestion. And with that, let me turn it over to Scott, who's going to tell you a little more of the details of how this architecture works. So I'm going to touch on some of the high points of the architecture. That's a bit of a, an eye chart up here. But uh, we'll talk about uh, you know, data ingestion. So what do we use for data ingestion? We used an uh, open source framework called Flume which is a streaming data ingestion framework. Um, basically, the ASUPs come in. We Flume takes ASUPs. It sections them into smaller events and sends them into the cluster. Uh, inside the cluster, uh, we do a couple of things. One, we write uh, some data to HBase. 
uh, for downstream low latency access. We also uh, take a great deal of the data, look most of the ASIP events, and write them to HDFS. Uh, Scoop, which is an open source uh, relational data you know, synchronization framework, so we leverage that to bring in uh, information like customer data into the cluster, so for downstream joining of information when we're doing our reporting and analytics. Um, so those are kind of the high points. Obviously, we use MapReduce for a lot of things. Uh, looking forward, uh, post uh, proof of concept, uh, specifically around high availability, uh, our plans are to have active active clusters. So basically, uh, we're going to have ingestion happening for two clusters simultaneously to support the disaster recovery scenario. Uh, Flume and HBase are components in here. They have a sort of built-in fault tolerance. Uh, we're looking at uh, you know, name node and job tracker high availability and, and uh, NetApp's uh, great work that's going on with the Ingenio storage to support uh, high availability on that layer. And then uh, you know, clearly uh, enterprise class uh, master nodes and commodity data nodes. So what does this cluster have to do? What use cases does it need to support? Well, the first one is data ingestion. So ASUPs are, uh, as uh, Kumar pointed out, they're delivered from filers in the phone home, phone home scenario. Average size of an ASUP is around 20 megabytes. Uh, and they come in sort of three flavors. The first is an actionable. So uh, if an issue happens on a filer, let's say a drive fails, uh, an actionable ASUP is sent uh, uh, in order to create, create a case, ship a new disk, uh, weekly logs. So all the filers send uh, weekly data back, which includes configuration data and also more event data, and performance data. So lots of counters. You know, these filers are very sophisticated. A lot of devices, a lot of detailed information around particular uh, timings of events and, so, and such. So um, <clears throat> in the case of Actionables, we have a, a, a service level agreement we need, to, we need to meet, which is less than one minute. So in order to do that, uh, we use Flume decorators. So as we stream in an ASAP event, we're doing two things. Number one, we're, we're taking that 20 megabyte event and we're chunking it into much smaller events so we can stream them in faster. Um, what we're also doing is using Flume decorators to look into the contents of that event. And in the case of an actionable, uh, what we're doing is we're routing that event out of the cluster into something like SAP for, for case creation. And that's got a service level agreement of you know, case creation in less than one minute. Um, for other uh, sort of you know, regular predictable ASAPs, those come into the cluster, they get into uh, HDFS, we store all the raw data, and then they, they have sort of a longer service level agreement. So 15 minutes it needs to be made available. So, we have a batch component to ingestion, and we also have sort of a real-time component, or synchronous uh, component to ingestion. And you can see here, you know, given our, our 10, 10 node POC cluster, we're able to achieve about 200 gigabytes per hour uh, using uh, 10 flume collectors. The second use case is supporting low latency services, right? So we have HBase in, in, our, in our architecture primarily because we have other applications who want to make use of this information. And so we have a data services layer on top of, or in front of the cluster, if you will, for REST-based requests, for example. So other applications want to look at configuration changes made over time. Uh, event lookup. So one of the things we do is we store not only parsed uh, ASAP data into consumable formats like HBase and Hive, but we also keep all the raw data around. And what we do is we store locations and offsets of those individual sections because they're still very valuable to the engineers who are supporting uh, customers. And so uh, we use indexes and offsets in HBase for fast lookup. And then you can actually reach in and grab the actual raw sessions at, sections out of HDFS. Uh, we didn't use Solar Cloud or Clustered Lucene in the proof of concept, but we expect to use that to build our secondary indexes. Uh, is, and you can kind of see the HBase table format. So our key structure uses system IDs and timestamps to facilitate range scans. We have different column families, physical, for example, for 
you know, device information or physical configuration information. We also have logical uh, for types of information like, uh, you know, volume information or RAID configuration. So we're trying to partition the data into sort of meaningful sets. Uh, you can see here in the physical for device config, uh, one thing that we're doing is we're storing uh, data in HBase uh, columns as JSON structures, fairly complex JSON structures. One of the reasons for that is um, this data is very big. Uh, some of these structures have hundreds of, of uh, uh, data elements or name value pairs. And we felt like keeping the co uh, column families relatively uh, narrow and long is probably more suitable for this application than sort of trying to build very wide column families. So the third <clears throat> use case, obviously, batch reports and analytics. So um, in the proof of concept and moving forward, we're going to be using Hive, um, doing things like looking at hot volumes over the entire install base. So that's a, you know, 100,000 filers um, you know, using Hive, you know, a SQL-like, fairly easy to understand language uh, to do fairly complex queries on data that's not only uh, in HBase, but also uh, in external tables as flat files uh, in HDFS. Uh, another sort of interesting one, which uh, NetApp had no capability to do before, is event pattern search. So if you look at all this information, uh, you know, hundreds of terabytes now up to petabytes of log data, you know, there, there was no facility to actually look into that data and query for something very specific, uh, you know, a specific pattern or event uh, over the install base or for a particular customer or system. Um, <clears throat> given this, this infrastructure, we actually can enable that now. Um, and you can see the difference here between the HBase, the data stored in HBase, and the data stored in the external tables. Much smaller data set in HBase, primarily to support uh, low latency lookups. Most of the data that's coming in from ASEPs is really in external tables in HDFS that are mapped as uh, <clears throat> Hive tables. We use partitioning uh, schemes to, to facilitate scans on the, H, on the Hive side. And then on the HBase side, you know, we ha I mentioned the, the, how we key, uh, key the data and also we're sort of keeping track of uh, those two Hive JIRAs which will eventually uh, improve query performance uh, uh, from Hive to HBase over time. So one of the outputs here is that, uh, you know, we're able to use Hive to join data with HBase and files that are in HDFS. Uh, as you saw earlier, we have JSON structures that we're, that we're storing in HBase. So how do we get access to those? And one of the things uh, we did was we developed a new UD, uh, JSON path UDF. Uh, Hive does support a JSON uh, function, but what we found was that, you know, for joining uh, data and correlating uh, external data to much deeper, more complex JSON structures in HBase, uh, we wound up having to write our own. And it's based on uh, the JSON path, and we made that available as open source. As Kumar indicated earlier on, the data volume to be, is going to grow so that by 2015, five years of data will be two petabytes of data. Um, but that's not all you have to store. So you always want to have additional space available for analysis. What we always see is that people discover there's so much value in analyzing this data that the amount of data you want for scratch analysis for downstream derived products ends up exceeding the amount of raw data. But for initial planning, people typically will want to start with 50 to 100% of the storage space if, of the raw input data that's allocated for downstream analysis. And an additional thing that you want to plan for is about 20% of the total space in the cluster free. This allows you to have temporary files from your, your shuffles and sorts, and it also ensures that you don't have fragmented disks with lots and lots of data loaded on them, which degrades system performance. Now, in the proof of concept, we use direct attached storage commodity drives, but we're looking forward to working with the innovative Ingenio storage solution that Kumar is going to tell you a little bit about here now. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. So we plan to move on productionizing this solution, and then the productionizing solution will be with our recent acquisition, which is Ingenio solution, as you all seen and heard from Val's keynote message, uh, we are planning to use the E2600 for higher performance and then availability. 
by means of hardware, uh, some rich features like hardware rate controls and all those things. Obviously, we want to just kind of avoid single point of failure. So that's our plan to just go on productionalizing this solution. Yeah. So with that, I wanted to conclude with a couple of thoughts. One is we're excited about the opportunity to be building an advanced analytic application around device support data with one of the leaders in the industry, NetApp, that we think it's, it's great that these technologies, Hadoop, that grew up with online data around web activity, click streams, are so germane to other domains. In this case, device data at web scale, the ability to have hundreds of terabytes, petabytes of data for automatically generated logs and performance issues to be able to do the same kind of advanced analyses, building models, being able to look into the data with low latency as well as larger scale batch analysis and reporting, that these same approaches work super well in the device arena as well. And you know, we think that there's a, a tremendous opportunity building on the open source ecosystem of Hadoop and that we're excited to be working together. You know, one of the key things is by handling great support for unstructured data, you could have more agility in the solution, as well as massive scale, and you have the ability to build more advanced analytics over time, initially providing basic access, but ultimately building predictive models. So we're really excited by that, and it's great to, to be able to pull together some the various open source projects, Hadoop, HBase, Hive, Flume, and um, of course, HDFS, and uh, and Pig, well, actually, Pig is a future roadmap item, and we, we didn't talk a lot about it, but streaming is another important element where we're able to reuse some Perl scripts. So with that, we have a few minutes left here, and would love to have any questions you might have for us. The um, ad hoc queries are sometime, uh, that might take a while, right? So if your Salesforce, for instance, using your serial ATA drives wanted to see what's the highest margin and most reliable drive. How are you managing that, that output as far as if that took a half a day to get that answer back to the end user? Okay, so the question is, some of these queries can be, low, can be high latency, and if, say, a salesperson wanted to get access to information quickly, how would you handle it? And I think the answer there is that you have certain classes of queries that need to be able to be answered quickly, and you have to pre-prepare data to answer those kinds of questions. So if you want to be able to let sales reps have a summary of, for example, what's, what's important for this customer, typically you'll build profiles of the customers using a batch process to pre-score them with some live updates as events come in. So when I'm looking at the customer's record, I know that my overall model of the customer is that this is what's happening with them, this is a capacity plan, these are things they might be interested in. And oh, by the way, one minute ago, a drive failed and they may be calling about that, right? So it's a blend of preparing things in batch for efficiency with fast real-time response. You know, you, you obviously can't do a, a half-day report on, in a second in any environment, so it's about being judicious about what are the things you can do quickly and what things you need to prepare and what things, um, you know, often these kinds of advanced analytics or capabilities that the organization didn't have to ask these questions at all, but they're not serving questions that you want to answer within a minute of a customer interaction. I have a question regarding proactive monitoring. So let's say uh, a device is generating events, and event two depends on event one, depends on event zero, and based on that analytics, you can do some proactive monitoring, saying that there is uh, case of this failure or whatever. How do you partition your data so that event two, event one, and event zero reside in the same node, whether using flume decorators or others, um, so that you can run that analytics in a MapReduce architecture? So the question is, if you've got an analysis of correlated events, how do you partition the data for efficient processing? I know, Scott, if you want to tackle that one. So uh, in the case of uh, uh, NetApp, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the important things is if these events are correlated off a single system, we're basically partitioning all of the data that comes in for a particular system and serial ID uh, and timestamps. So they're grouped very closely. And we're creating indexes in Hive for individual systems. So if we did, do, if we did have to focus on, a, on, an, on, a, on an individual system, uh, we're able to do that relatively quickly. Uh, the, it, we haven't really addressed 
you know, the proactive monitoring as of yet in terms of in, BOC. in, in, the, in the proof of concept. That's something we're working through. So we don't, we don't have the notion right now of an event comes in and we, we sort of detect some, some state about that event and then another event comes in and we can correlate this, the state of the first event with the second one. Most of that right now is really batch oriented. The plan is, you know, the daily types of runs to, to deal with those. Thanks. Uh, in your storage component, do you have just the spinning disk or you also have a SSD mix since the storage is pretty large? Right? So if people did, I don't know if people heard, the question is, is it simply spinning disk in the storage component or are there solid state drives as well? And certainly in the proof of concept, it was all spinning disks. Spinning. Um, Kumar, if you want to address. Yeah, so in the, in the proof of concept, we use the spinning disk. But moving forward, we will be using our engineer storage, which is, yeah. So E2600, which we are in the working. Uh, so we can, we can only talk about it later, probably. Yeah. We can have an offline conversation. OK, so that, yeah. that will have SSD as well. Yes, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could share any insights from running your POC, from looking at your data, something that you didn't know before, but by using this, you, um, you found out. Great question. What, what insights were derived by looking at this data during the POC process itself? I know that, I know that there was an analytic example that we were able to run, where it, you know, one of these event searches, where you know, we, we, one of the, the real aha moments, I think, was being able to actually pull up a list of systems that matched a complex pattern, not just, a sing, not just an alert, but certain constraints around what kind of machine and what kind of drives, to be able to say, hey, here's, here's the actual list of people affected, which was previously a research project. Being able to do that, even, even on a subset of data, being able to actually see that list was a real aha moment. I don't know if there were others that came to mind. Yeah, apart from that, it's, uh, it's all about scaling. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the very key thing, which we were kind of really having a lot of bottleneck uh, with a massive amount of data which we are receiving from all these machine generated devices and the sense from our install base. So we were not able to just kind of really support our field and sales folks if they have to just kind of retrieve some of the data or extract data. And also we have to run with our traditional legacy data stores for days. Yeah, so you have seen that what our SLAs were less than a minute with the same amount of data. So that's, that's one of the other key things. Yeah. I, I would venture to say that there were, people were surprised by how well this all worked. Yeah. That there were a lot of skeptics who didn't think that you could use a Hadoop-based architecture for this kind of complex system. And, and they were impressed by the end result. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I have two questions. First question is, um, you mentioned that you use Flume um, to ingest data. Uh, the peak input you said was 200 gigabyte per hour. Is that actually Flume or is that a batch put API that you're using for the batch use case? So, that, that, so the, the question is, we mentioned we used Flume for batch ingest, or for ingest of data. Right. And the peak, as we identified, was 200 gigabytes an hour, which is the spike, the highest level of input, and that was indeed the rate of data flowing into the system through Flume. Okay. The second question I have is the low latency use cases. Can you just talk a little bit about what exact use cases are you using this entire system for in a low latency uh, fashion? Okay. So this will have to be the last question. We're running low on time. Um, so low latency use cases um, were primarily examples like people want to look up a configuration of a system, scan through a series of changes. In, in seconds, so being able to look up records around a cluster or a system and quickly provide access to a, an online application. And that's based on data that you've received recently? Yes. In, in a, uh, what's the freshness of that data on average? Like, is it constantly coming or you're looking at a window, like a mi micro batch window of some, some period of time? So the, the service level agreement is that as data comes in, it needed to be accessible for those low latency requests within 15 minutes. 15. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, thank All right. you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.